so excited you're here. We've been talking about this for a while. We finally got it to work with your schedule and with mine. Yes. And I mean, I remember I met you at Mary Crowley's event in Texas and yes. I was blown away. Aww. I was blown away at your honesty uh, of your vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And I mean, truly an incredible story, a heartbreaking story and how you turned, you know, just such a, such a, such a childhood into one of the most amazing testimonies I've ever heard. So I want you to just go into your testimony. Sure. Yeah. I mean, when just you saying that right there, literally my childhood was so traumatic and it, it was something really out of a horror film. And I didn't even know that though, because I was drugged every time before each abuse. So I had no idea until I was like 12, 13, started acting out, having behavioral problems, falling into addiction really quickly and all that. So what happened was uh, my exploitation started when I was seven years old and the perpetrator was a businessman, a trusted man who lived across the street from us. He was a funeral director of a mortuary and he had an apartment inside that mortuary. He was married and he lived a quiet life. So everybody thought inside that mortuary. But unfortunately, he was not who everybody thought he was. He lived that secret life of being a pedophile. And I wasn't the only child that he brought into that funeral home. There were little boys that were in there as well. And he also used me to recruit and to bring children there. I had no idea. I just thought I was bringing them for these, you know, weekend stayovers. And unfortunately, that's not it, what it was. Um, he drugged us through lemonade and with chocolate chip cookies. And we had no idea they were laced with drugs. And wow. he would uh, sexually exploit us through the use of what we used to call child pornography, but child sexual abuse material is the correct term today. And, um, you know, as a little girl, when you have things like that happen to you, and he also forced us to watch pornography for hours on end and then want us to reenact it as well. So it really does damage to your brain as a child. Yeah, because you probably never heard of anything to do with pornography until he showed yeah. it to you. Well, I, I know there's probably a question that people are wondering, how in the world did your parents not notice that their seven-year-old daughter is not home? What, what did your parents think that you were? Yeah, that's the first question that everybody asked me for sure. So my mom and my dad were going through a divorce, but my dad was also my first perpetrator. Uh, I was sexually abused by him for 10 years inside our home. So I was already preconditioned. My sexuality was already awakened at a really young age. And so this kind of, you know, to my body and to what I was experiencing felt very similar to what I was going through at home. And um, both my parents were struggling with alcoholism. And my dad was a part of the Hells Angels. I just grew up in this kind of rough crowd and inside the bar scene and all of that. So there wasn't a lot of parental supervision during this time of my life. And this man, actually, my mom trusted him during that time because he said, I'll take your girls for the weekend and, um, you know, you can have your free time. You can do whatever she needed to do. And so she thought he literally was the kindest grandfather figure that was taking care of her children on the weekend. So she had absolutely no idea what was happening to me inside that funeral home. And as a matter of fact, I only shared with her about three years ago uh, what happened. I, I, I honestly didn't even ever want to share it because it's so horrific. Um, but my <laughs> life became so public that I had to, you know, I didn't want her to hear it on something else. Right. Because now, you know, you have a book out. Yeah. And I'm just going to actually throw it up here uh, while we're talking about I, I have the book and I, I've yet to read it. And I've been wanting to read it. Unlikely Warrior. I cannot wait to read this book. I mean, again, you know, traumatic childhood. Uh, but what what did your mom say when you told her what happened? She was horrified. She was absolutely horrified. She felt very bad. Um, so did my older sister because she had no knowledge of it as well. Um, it's funny, though, when I, I started to become more public with my story, I had people reach out to me um, from 
junior high and high school and people that I invited into that funeral home that said no, their parents had said no to them um, because they had red flags back then saying something's not right here. I mean, yeah, what do you want to like babysit children on the weekends when they're in working a funeral home? In a funeral in home. It was his apartment was on top of the funeral home. So not normal, not normal at all. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know in today's society if you heard of somebody living in a funeral home and then him wanting children over all the time. There's something there's no, definitely there's yeah. definitely something totally wrong with him. I mean, it's like someone hanging out at the cemetery all the time and like your children goes for go for a walk in the park at the cemetery every day. No, I don't think so. It's not happening. No. But, no. but okay, so you were 17 when he got you into his home. Do you remember anything that no, first time? I was seven, seven through the age of 12 is when I was sexually exploited mm. um, through him. So that happened at a pretty young age. So by the time I'm 12, I am drinking and doing drugs on my own because I'm trying to cope with the pain. Right. Did, the I, did I say 17? I meant to say seven. Seven. Yeah, yeah I yeah. meant to say seven. So at seven, I meant to say, um, what do you remember? I mean, so again, he, he was showing you pornography, told you to bring friends over. You said you kind of had recollections later on, but what do you remember from those early times, those early moments? Yeah. Um, most of the memories that I do have are pretty graphic to share. They're okay. really graphic. I mean, it's something I straight. Out of that film. Yeah. I can tell you, and I just started sharing recently a little bit of this, um, that his wife was present. She was there. And, she had no idea she was there. He had drugged her as well. So one of the reasons I started sharing this recently is because a lot of people that if you're married to a pedophile, they'll do anything, anything to get to these children. So he would drug her and he propped her up in the corner. Yeah. Huh. During everything. It's straight up out of a horror film. So she had no idea too. There were many times where the drugs would wear off on me and I would come to and I would be in these situations and, and, and that's when like all of my uh, flashbacks and my night terrors and all everything that happened to me in that funeral home came back to haunt me in my 20s. Um, and so it is interesting because some of the drugs started to wear off and he'd come right back over and give me something and then I'd go back out again. Yeah. Oh gosh, I can't even imagine someone just wanting to drug someone and have pleasure on them, especially children. Like, you know. So sickening. So what are the warning signs that you would tell parents? I know you kind of went through a little bit right now, but what are warning signs you tell parents definitely watch out for? Yeah. You know, it's funny because you can actually have somebody in your life that's in your inner circle, that's in your neighborhood, that's, you know, a coach or anybody that's around your kids on a regular basis. And you could trust them and you could think they're great people. And I don't care how much um, red flags you see or anything that you think that may not be normal. I just say, trust your gut. You'll know in your gut. Mm -hmm. That one friend of mine that re reached out recently told me, um, you know, my mom just knew something was off and something wasn't right. So I, I, that's the biggest thing that I can tell you. But I also just, you know, if there's older men wanting to be around younger children and finding ways to spend quality time with them alone, on a regular basis. I mean, I don't know. That's a massive red flag. Yeah. And, and listen, pedophiles can, a lot of times to get access to these children, they'll have jobs where they have access to children. They're either a school teacher, a coach, you know, a babysitter, youth, pastor. youth pastor. I've heard horror stories of that as well. Positions where parents automatically trust you. Yeah. And, and I agree with you. I mean, it's, you know, trust your instinct, trust the Holy spirit. The Holy spirit will tell you everything. And even when I wasn't saved, you have, you know, yeah, gut, you know, gut feeling, especially like a maternal instinct as well for women. Like we have really, really, really great intuition and trust it as a parent. And, and obviously, you know, Red flags. I have someone wanting to spend time with your kid all the time, living in a funeral home, you know, living on top of a funeral home. Um, I, so I want to tell you this too. One of the things after I told my mom, my mom started to dig through pictures of me from my childhood, and she found a picture of him and I in Los Angeles at the Rose Bowl. And neither one of us, nobody in the family, we asked everybody. So she also found other pictures. So he was traveling with me as well. Wow. And Nobody, she said, I never gave him permission to, to take you other places or because I lived in San Francisco in the outskirts there in the Bay Area. Um, so 
he actually took me places. He took me to sporting events and different places like that. And I have no memory to this day, even after seeing the picture, no memory whatsoever of any of it. Wow. Right? Um, have you ever went public with his name? Have you ever pressed charges on him? No, he passed away. Mm. Uh, and I also just found out recently in the last maybe six months or so that the owner of the funeral home himself was abusing his daughter, which was about my age. And she ended up committing suicide um, because her the abuse went into her adulthood and she never got to get away from them. So now I'm finding out more pieces of the puzzle in the last six months since I wrote my book and have come out. People just keep coming out from the woodworks. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to know all this. So it is just it's really you know, I, I normally share my part of my abuse from my dad and what I went through and how much self-hatred that I have had and how I turned to addiction and, and to my addiction in men and all of that. And so in the in the recent last few months, I'm sharing more about this. And it's not easy, that's for sure, because it's so graphic. And I'm trying to be very sensitive, too, because it is a real trigger alert to anybody who's been through something like this as well. What would you say to someone that's watching right now? Let's say they're going through YouTube and they have been abused. Yeah. And they are, you know, they got to this, this video because maybe I tagged it. You know, have you been sexually abused? What yeah. would you say to them right now if you're, if they're watching? Well, first of all, it's not your fault. That's the biggest thing. It is not your fault. Um, the people that, you know, that have come into your life and that have abused you like this, they are very sick people. And, um, and that is the biggest core issue that I struggled with my entire life was feeling like something was wrong with me. I had, I just felt like there's something wrong with me and I couldn't pinpoint it ever. I had this self-hatred. Um, I self-harmed. I tried to commit suicide a few times and that is what sexual abuse does to you. It tears away at your inner identity and who you are. And that is not who you are. That was a chapter in your story, in your life. And that actually can be something that can catapult you and help you. Um, like with me, you know, I'm able to share my story and help other people articulate and be able to share their stories as well. So I just want you to know it's not your fault. Yes. Amen. And that's something that I've, I've noticed with a lot of survivors is that they felt like it was their fault and it's not your fault. If you're a child being drugged or molested from by a parent, it's not your fault. And it's 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 heartbreaking to hear that this happened to you. It happens to other kids. And it, it's just horrendous. You know, we pray God's mercy on those people as well, because a lot of times it's a cycle. They, they were abused as a kid and it's just a cycle, perpetual cycle that happens in people, not to make an excuse of it, but to talk about the, the reality of that being also a cycle yeah. um, and you not being, you know, you not being aware of bringing other kids there. You thought well, you're going to play um, and it's not your fault. But um, I want to ask you, what is your, how did you find Jesus? You know, you're, you're, you're 12 years old, you start numbing yourself and you don't understand really why you're numbing yourself with drugs and alcohol and why you're just yearning for men. And, 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 you know, I've been there. I didn't have a dad in my life really. I mean, I did, but, um, not as much as I needed one as a teenager really. So I found love in other places. And so you kind of went down that trajectory as well. Talk about that, that teen year and then your twenties as well. And then how you found the Lord. Yeah. So a few friends of mine um, that had similar experiences as me, we started hanging out in the streets in San Francisco and uh, we hung out on Broadway, which the entire street was littered with strip clubs. And at the very end was two heavy metal clubs. So we're hanging out one night in that little alleyway and um, we're drinking Thunderbird and just having a fun old time. We're looking at the back door to a strip club and then we are, our backs are against the wall to a door um, that led into the heavy metal club. And one night this guy comes out and he says, hey, you guys are always out here. Let me get you some fake IDs and have you come inside and um, hang out with older guys. And so we were so excited, free drinks and older men. <laughs> so we end up taking up that invitation. I meet my first boyfriend in there. He's a lead singer of a popular band at the time. And I'm backstage and enjoying myself. I am 17 at the time. And um, I end up coming out of the bathroom and there's these two guys that are standing there and it was just an encounter, okay? <laughs> it, was, it was Bobby Dahl and Brett Michaels from Poison. 
but I had no idea who they were at the time. I just knew that I was like, hello, <laughs> I hadn't seen men that beautiful before. So they felt the same way. I ended up being, um, if you could call dating, I mean, it's really not dating with these rock stars. Let me just say. <laughs> Ruby club. Yep. Because <laughs> you're pretty much his number one, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. And when I was 17, I was hanging out with them for almost a good year and they opened up for, um, for kicks, K I X and popular, uh, eighties band and, uh, from back from Maryland. And so I ended up meeting the drummer that night and ran off with him. I just was not interested in all that Brett had to offer because his life was absolutely crazy. And, I wanted to be more, it was interesting too, um, just my thought process back then. I just wanted to be with one guy. You know, I didn't want to be like a huge. I understand. <laughs> <Same here. laughs> Still fun, you know, I was like, I'm just with one person, not like 10 million of them, you know. But. Exactly. Yeah. And he was 12 years older than me. And so I was looking for a daddy figure for sure and looking for somebody to take care of me. Mm -hmm. I ended up getting in a horrific car accident on my way back from L.A. that that weekend after meeting him. And I got home out of the hospital and um, my, I mean, it was a miracle that I lived, got home from the hospital and there were two dozen red roses from Jimmy. And um, he had called and said, I want you on the next flight. I want you to move back here to Maryland with me. And so at 18 years old, I jumped ship and moved across the country with him and lived with him for almost four years. Now, during this time, and one of his rules in his home was that you could not be a drug addict. You know, it's fine if you wanted to drink, but no drugs in his home. So I, he's I started, a rock star, but he doesn't do drugs. Right. There's Only alcohol. And so I had to hide my drug use from him for a long time. But unfortunately, everything crashed and burned. I got really, really super, you know, I almost OD'd. And um, he's just like, you need to get help. And the band agreed. Everybody agreed. So we're like, OK, so I moved back to California and I get into rehab, I start going to AA, and I'm really serious about my sobriety, but it's short lived because I become a makeup artist and I start working at Macy's downtown San Francisco. And this girl comes in um, to work with me for the day and invites me out to the underground club scene it, when the raves were all happening and all that. And I didn't want to tell her about my sobriety. I wanted to have fun and I wanted to go out with her. So um, yeah, we met the owner of that club that night. He sent a bottle of Dom Perignon to our table and that was the end of my sobriety, my short lived. And so for almost eight years, I'm hanging out with this celebrity, you know, restaurant owner and club owner in San Francisco, meeting all kinds of celebrities and living this fast life again. And actually my drug use got even worse. Sure. And I got to this point where I just started to feel really empty inside. It was like, and I didn't know what soul searching was, but I was so unhappy on the inside. And so I just started like sifting through, there has to be more to life than what I'm experiencing right now and started asking myself these questions. And so I'm working in a salon with my sister. She's doing nails and I did skincare and she's working on one of her male clients and doing a manicure on him. Mm -hmm. And she says, um, I'm walking by the station and going to get one of my clients and her client reaches out to me and grabs my arm and said, Hey, Lisa, I'd like to invite you to church this Sunday. And I said, me church. Why would you invite a girl like me to church? And I just was so confused because I had never been to church. I had no knowledge really of God. And I thought this guy has lost his mind. And he said, you know what? He said, you're right. He said, you're probably one of the biggest sinners I've ever met in my life. <laughs> like, That's encouraging. <laughs> like, so why am I going to church? And he says, oh, yeah. And you might burn when you catch on fire when you walk through the doors, too. And I'm like, OK, so why would I go to church? <laughs> and he goes, oh, that's easy. It's really hot guys there. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. OK. So I ended up accepting the invitation to go to church that Sunday. And my sister came along with me and I went to church for all the wrong reasons. And I went back, I went to that church for over a year for all the wrong reasons. Looking for, looking for a good I, guy. Is that what it was? I dated half the guys in that church. I even dated the worship leader. I mean, everybody, I was just doing the same thing I was doing in the clubs. And I found out that a lot of the men that were in the church were just as broken as me. Oh my God. And I had a, quite an experience. So I ended up coming to a point where I detoxed off of men for a year. 
and I just married the Lord and I just got in a Bible study and to worship and I fell in love with him. And when that pastor had an altar call and said, who wants to give their life to the Lord today? I jumped out of my seat like a jack in a box and I was screaming and hollering, waving my hands. Everybody knew I got saved that day because I'm like, that's me. I need Jesus. <laughs> and it's the best decision that I have ever, ever made. I'm just so I'm more on fire today in my relationship with the Lord. I mean, he's my lover. He's my friend. He's my confidant. He guides me in everything that I do every single day of my life. And um, he's the best lover. I'll tell you, he's the best lover out there. He is. He knows all your needs, all your desires. He's so special. He, he's romantic. He's loving. He's also very protective, awesome. jealous uh, of, of anyone that takes away time from him. He's right. also a healer, a provider, everything that little girls look for and young women look for and, and even older women look for. It's in Jesus. Yeah. He's everything. He's what our heart is looking for. Um, and so then you got into ministry, right? You have a, your CEO of the ministry, Untethered Ministry. So how did that come about? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll let you know. I met my husband in that church a year, a year later. Yes. <laughs> Well, I, want to see details. I was going to ask, are you married? That's right. You are. Yeah. Yeah. We got married and um, we moved to Scottsdale, Arizona. And actually that's when all my trauma surfaced. So here. Oh, and I'll, I forgot to tell you, when I gave my life to the Lord, I got radically delivered of drugs and alcohol. Everything Ooh. my desire was gone and I had absolutely nothing in me again to ever drink again or do anything. Yeah. yeah. You know, the, the Lord did that with me one day as well right before I received him, delivered of, you know, my addiction to this, addiction to that, alcohol too, delivered one day. See, the Lord doesn't do things in a process. He does it. But sometimes our human brain, you know, it goes through a process to kind of rewire our thinking yeah. in the world. And so that sometimes is a, a very much a process, but though that's amazing. So the Lord delivered you right away when you Yep. So here I am clean. I'm married and I'm living in Scottsdale, Arizona. And I also am away from my support system at home and all the night terrors and all the nightmares started to surface for me. I started to self harm again at 28 years old. 28 and 29, um, I started self-harming. I started acting out. All the behavioral problems that I had as a little girl came back. And I started, I went right back to that girl that I was then. It was really scary. And the first four years of our marriage was really, really difficult. Um, it was not easy at all. So there was an incredible pastor who took me under his wing in Scottsdale. And he would show up at our apartment at one o'clock in the morning when I was having these major outbursts and trying to harm myself. And my husband didn't know what to do with me. Whoa. And um, then I found a skilled psychiatrist. Can I, can I ask you a question? Did your, was, your hus was your husband aware of this yet? Because you said it's starting to surface, but it, it didn't really, you didn't really understand where it was coming from. No, he, he honestly was so confused. He didn't know. He's like, what happened to the girl I married? What's wow. happening? He was ready to leave me. He kept like going back and forth. And um, we just, you know, after me getting this um, skilled psychiatrist, we were able to figure out what I had gone through. And we were able to go back to my memories, back to the places, all the night terrors that were happening, all the bad dreams and the flashbacks that then we were starting to be able to put together the pieces of the puzzle of what happened to me. So yeah, um, it was really, really difficult, very difficult. I mean, I just wanted to die. That's all. I mean, you just, when you have all of those memories come back, especially when you didn't remember them from the beginning, but now as an adult woman, you're remembering them. It makes it just very difficult. So. Did, did, did you think when it surfaced back into your m memory, did you think it was a, just a bad dream and just bad visions? Or did you know that it really happened? I did know that it happened because, and I was haunted by them and haunted by everything that was happening, but no, I knew. And then I was able to talk to the other people that were there as well. And, um, and you know, really it's, it's pretty amazing once you have all that happen and you start to ask, do you remember this? And do you remember that? So it was, you know, one of my family members told me that if there weren't other witnesses, and if there weren't other children that were involved that have that correlate the story that happened to me, they might not have believed me because it's so graphic and so horrific. So um, I I hate that that even has to happen. Like somebody else had to hear, oh, they had that same experience, too, because whenever a victim comes to us as an organization, which I'll share a little bit about that, um, the first thing I do is believe them. 
I mean, why are we going to make up these horrible stories, you know? So, um, yeah. So there were other people that had those same memories too, which helped me to piece it together. Yeah, on, on the one hand, it's really disappointing and hurtful. And on the other hand, they, you, you, they might think, well, Lisa didn't show any signs of it. Now, 20 years later, she's talking about this. You know, where did this come from? Unless, it's, you know. Yeah. My whole family knew that something was wrong. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I, my, I was the black sheep of my family. Ah. I I had a lot of behavioral issues. Everybody knew that something's not right with Lisa. <laughs> and, and again, that, that's a warning sign for parents, for family. There's something wrong. And yeah. just really quickly, just just point out the, those the, those just those those warnings. Your your yeah. behavior. So, so trying to hurt yourself, wanting you know, talking about suicide and talking about not wanting to live anymore. Um, looking for drugs and alcohol, um, wanting sex, you know, and wanting sex at an early age. And um, trying to think what else. I just blanked out on it. <laughs> Acting out, right. Or maybe having like just some blow ups here and there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Tant tantrums for sure. Not really making sense, like in a situation like everything's all over the place and you can't really articulate what you're going through. Yeah. Wow. And so you then you got into ministry, decided to take, actually, before we get into that, there was also something that you found out too, which was that you mentioned this briefly before that he would take videos. And so he, he would use these videos and it somehow ended up on the, on the, you know, on the black market as well, right? These child exploitation videos. It's, it's not just child pornography. It's, it's sexual child abuse. Mm -hmm. um, how did you find out about that? And um, what did you find out? Yeah, from from the other witnesses and other people that were there. And then not only that, I um, a couple of times when I came to when I was drugged, I was actually in the dark room. And um, those were some of my memories of me being in the dark room where the pornography was being edited and um, the films, all the films were like there and all over the walls and everything like that. So I actually physically saw all of it as well. I see. Yeah. So before he passed away, did it ever come out that he was a pedophile? Did we, we, I have not been able to find anything. Wow. Um, and then since the owner of the uh, funeral home had, had passed away as well, and then his daughter killed himself, the only, there's only one living relative that we know of from then. So, you know, today it, it's a lot easier, you know, digitally. You sure. can, what is it? Um, 90, 85 million unique visits have come to the National Center for Missing Children of child pornography. We have a huge problem. Today, it's just so much easier to access and to keep in a digital form and all of that. This was something that was really old school that was very, very secret. And um, more than likely, he was part of a, a pedophile ring and selling it to other pedophiles as well. Because why would he have such an elaborate setup? You right. know? Yeah. Makes my blood boil. I know. So wicked. Um, I know. It's a lot. It is a lot. Wow. To think that there are literally ring organizations that sell this material that gets kids together. I mean, it's just, it's just, sorry. It's super hard to even understand that there could be that perverse of people out there. And and what happens with pornography, I'm sure you know this, but you know, if you're an adult and you you see it once, your brain is trained to go back and see it again. You're curious. So you just keep going back and back and back. And pornography is designed mm -hmm. to not satisfy you. You want more and more and more. So it becomes more and more graphic. You want more and more violence. And then that doesn't satisfy your brain anymore either. So it turns to children. Yeah. So that's why we have such a problem today because pornography is so accessible that now child pornography is even worse than it's ever been. Yeah. And, and I was talking to someone that Mary knows, Mary Crowley knows about uh, pornography, like adult pornography. And then a lot of these women are exploited talking to Annie, Annie Lobear as well, talking about pornography with a lot of these women that they're not just there for money. They're actually, they've been exploited. There's, there's adult trafficking. I was gonna, I was gonna ask you, what do you think is the correlation between child pornography and adult pornography? Have you seen any correlation with your research or is it separate? 
I haven't seen anything per se with my research, but I mean, it is a true miracle that I am not involved in the adult entertainment industry or in, in adult pornography. I mean, I don't even know how that didn't happen, you know, cause I was easily set up for all of that. You know, I guess I just wasn't invited into that space or those circles. So Christ yeah. God, hand was on you. So then you jumped into ministry. Yeah. You, you <laughs> called untethered ministries and you yeah. really only recently been vocal mm -hmm. about what you've been through where you also wrote a book, which we're going to get to in a second. Yeah. About untethered yeah, so ministries. Walking through the healing process and having my psychiatrist and the pastor um, walking me through that healing process and going through deliverance as well. Um, I, you know, it was just amazing. God just started to show that I had this strong leadership role and wanted me to move in ministry. And so I got ordained as a minister. I started a nonprofit in San Antonio, Texas. And this was about 10 years ago that I did this. And I started with a Starbucks card, a $20 bill and a pair of feather earrings and walked into the first strip club um, in town. And I didn't know anybody here. We just moved here from Scottsdale. And so we just showed up with a couple gifts and just said, hey, we're here to let the girls know that we support them, that we want them to know they're not alone and um, that we care for them and we want to see, give them any kind of support. And now it's crazy. 10 years later, the clubs, the club owners, the managers, they look at me as the chaplain over their clubs. So when they have an emergency happen in the club, I'm the first person that they call. They're like, Lisa, we just had an overdose. Lisa, we just had a death, you know? And so they literally come to me for spiritual guidance and for um, for leading all of that as well, which is truly beautiful to see after a decade, right? Wow. That's yeah. Amazing. Wow. Praise yeah. God. I know. So we go into the club and we give gifts to the girls, something that you would love, you know, if I was giving you a gift for your birthday and um, let the girls know that they're loved, they're valued, that they're cared for and that we have services for them. We offer equine therapy, one on one advocacy and mentorship. Um, we'll, you know, go with them to court and sit with them in court when they're testifying against their traffickers. Uh, we will, we'll walk them through the entire journey of healing, just like my pastor, the psychiatrist, my husband, my family, you know, there were no programs for me back then. I was on my own, but I had a, a little bit of a support system. So now if we can provide a really big support system for girls like me, it, it makes a world of difference. I mean, we've seen women that have become realtors. Um, the nurses um, just really transitioning out of the industry and finding their true identity discovery. And um, I, I equate it like when we walk into the club, it's like the girls hear us, see us, they hear our stories. Mm -hmm. and they're awakened to the possibility of, oh, my gosh, I don't have to stay in this lifestyle all this time. They don't even think about it. They tell us that all the time. Like, I never really even considered leaving this strip club. I thought this was my life. We even, even have a DJ that's told us that. He was like, I've been here since I was 18 years old and he was in his 50s. Whoa. Lisa, I have never, ever even thought about having another job. Where would I go? And I said, well, you got to have some sort of dream in you. And then he said, well, I do. And so now he's living that dream. He doesn't work in the club anymore. Isn't that crazy? Oh, that's crazy. I love it. Wow. But you know, sometimes it takes that conversation, that one-on-one -on -one conversation mentoring. And I love that you take them from A to Z and that you even go to them to court yeah. because they're, they, they need someone with them that can hold their hand because a lot of times they don't have family or they don't have a support system around them. Or, you know, a lot of their family have maybe disowned them because now they're in strip clubs and, and their life has progressed from such a, from such a place where they envision for their child that they, they're probably not in their life as, life as much. And so that's wonderful that you do that from A to Z. Um, yeah. talk, talk about your book. Sure. Unlikely Warrior. Unlikely Warrior. Well, it's my full true story. Um, it's funny because Mary just wrote a book um, and I'm in it. And I give way in more, in more depth of um, the exploitation with the pedophile um, than I do than this book. But Unlikely Warrior is basically just sharing my story. It is an incredible book for anybody who's working with victims. So safe houses, um, counselors, we have people buying it by the case that when they have a new client come in, they ask them to read it. And I'm working on a workbook for it as well. So I can take you basically from A to Z 
of what happens to you from the time you're born to the abuse that you went through in your home, um, why you chose and went into all these different things and how you landed where you are. There's a lot of undoing, you know, um, when you go through violence in your home, um, sexual abuse in your home and a lot of dysfunction. And uh, so that's basically what it is, is just sharing my story and then sharing ways that you too can become an unlikely warrior as well. Amen. Amen. Well, Lisa, it has been such an eye opening conversation. I know that there are many parents sitting and watching this that are mortified and praying that their child never goes through what you've been subjected to. Yeah. And um, so thank you for coming on, warning us and letting us know that the, the, the truth that there are people out there that are very, very wicked and how to protect your child and also look at warning signs and um, bless you and your ministry. If you guys want to reach out to Lisa, you can go on her website. You can donate to her ministry Get the book. I can't wait to read it. I've been wanting to read it. I've been wanting to have a conversation with you since since we've we've uh, we've last spoken in in Texas. Well, we've spoken a little bit here and there, but <laughs> I'm just so grateful you came on. I cannot wait to read your whole book. I didn't realize that it was also like a, a walking you through from A to Z um, for someone who you know just warning signs as well and and what to do. Yeah, um, it's really good to help people understand what happened to them for sure. Everybody so far that's read my book, I'm, every single person has said they read it in one sitting. Once they picked it up, they could not put it down. So, wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Where can they purchase your book? At, at lisamichelle.org is the best place. But if you're international, Amazon, or if you just prefer Amazon, then go on Amazon. Okay, well, it's always better to go directly to the website so they don't have to pay any Amazon fees. So yes. you guys can go there. Lisa, Michelle, again, thank you. God bless you. We'll be praying for you. And, you know, and I know you're going to be coming back to talk about testimonies of, of, of men and women, just like Annie does. She's got incredible testimonies, too, of women being reached on the street um, through her ministry and, and through your ministry as well. So we wish you the best of luck. We'll be praying for you. We love you. Thank, thank you again for coming on. We love you so much. You're I an love amazing you. human being. God bless you. Bye, guys. Yeah.